Hello. Hello. Hey. Oh, disappeared. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. Just a reminder for everyone, you know, that we've been um, having a week lo weekend long um, intensive meditation retreat on the practice of karuna, of compassion. Um, but this Sunday period is also being joined by the people who usually just come for the Sunday sittings. Um, or maybe they might come for retreats as well, but this time they're just coming for the Sunday sittings. Um, so a little bit of a bigger group today. And we're happy to welcome everybody. Take, take your time to see everybody. Oops, let me get here. Can I undo? I am going to hide the fighting cats. <laughs> hmm. Last night as we closed, uh, Darine said good night to folks and said that she, <laughs> She offered that folks re reminded her of little taquitos rolled up in compassion. And uh, I've been thinking of you all that way all day long and it's brought a smile to my face. <laughs> little taquito yogis. <laughs> I hope you have felt that way mm, to some degree or another, swaddled in your Tortilla of compassion. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, um, I woke up last night, uh, like right at 2 a.m., in what felt like a kind of a sudden jolt of sobriety. I don't have a really great other way to kind of explain it. I've been thinking about how to kind of put it into words, but it's a it's something that feels familiar and and doesn't always happen in such a um strong kind of solid way um as that, but I recognize it and um It was very powerful. It, it was not like an, you know, uh, remorse about anything I had done. Because, um, you know, sometimes that can wake one up in the night and the sort of um, mental anguish from that. It was not anxiety about the coming day. But it felt like this very sober, clear um, acknowledgement of the sort of solidity of dukkha the Sometimes the Buddha will talk about this entire mass of suffering. And it's interesting. I don't know the Pali word that's being translated as mass, but sometimes it isn't, it's, it's not always evident sort of what that might mean. But there are in these moments where the, the, the massness, the, the density, the thickness, the, sub, the substantiality of, of hardship, of dukkha, of existence, um, just felt very present and very clear, um, very powerful. 
there was not a you know a strong emotional quality to the you know um, anguish or or even a strong sense of compassion but you but it, it could it felt like those were there you know there was there was pain there was compassion there was equanimity and a sort of honesty of this experience I have of sometimes what it feels like we're we're all up against the the reality of this solidity of and mysterious solidity at times of dukkha dependability suffering hardship whatever you know there's so many words um Steve has been using this wobbly wheel translation. And so just the, the sense of the truth of that and, and just how hard it is to be, you know, to be all of the many things we are, the, you know, uh, in terms of identity, in terms of our realities, like human beings and, uh, but, but something about existence that is such a challenge and um sometimes so present in 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 totally indistinct ways right not like this particular thing is hard or this quality of life or this action that these people did or that i did or what like none not in detail no detail just no content of it except that sort of bare fact and the solidity of it, <laughs> the feeling of the solidity of it. And it reminded me of a, of a, of a time when I was younger. And I, I think that there's some feeling of this I've had with me um, for a long time. But I, I remember when I was about 12, um, a, a period of some version of this experience that felt just so persistent and and newly painful um sort of anguish about something very hard to pin down very hard to exactly say what it was um but that felt very disturbing and very um upsetting and very true and almost entirely invisible and again, without any content, it's like I could point to anything that was hard in my life or in the world, but that there was something else that was um, really haunting and troubling about whatever you might say, life, being. And so I remember asking my parents if I could go to a, a therapist. and. Um, because I just didn't know, I didn't know what this was. I didn't know what to do with it. And I didn't know how to talk about it. And um, and so I remember very clearly this, like one night in the winter, my mom took me to meet some, some guy in um, Springfield, Massachusetts. And it was like so dark. It was like cold, so cold and dark. It was, it felt like, you know, it was probably like three in the afternoon, you know, but it was like pitch black and, uh, you know, so visceral. I'm going to this place and felt like nothing was open. And I, I talked to this person for some amount of time. I don't remember anything about our conversation, but I remember at the end, he, um, you know, he had me go kind of wait back in the office and then he brought my mom in and talked to her for a while. And, when we left, um, she was laughing. And uh, I, was, I was like, what? You know, she said, oh, you know, he said that he'd never, he'd never met a more well-adjusted kid. And, um, and I could see the sort of relief, you know, in my mom and her, her way of being. There was sort of this like giddiness and, and and there was some part of that that was like that I shared, right? Knowing that like, okay, there's something, there's not something wrong on some level. But it was also very disturbing on this other level, 
because I, this kind of wall came down in a way that um, also still feels very visceral of realizing that um, nobody could help me. That like, this was the, this was the only thing there was. And n- not only did they not, he didn't have a solution. He didn't even recognize the problem. And that sense of like, oh, I can't trust anyone with whatever this is. And so it feels very isolating, right? Um, And to just really, it's like, it wasn't until finding the Buddhist teachings, right? that I started to feel like, oh, first it's just in the meditation practice and then in the, you know, the context of it and the teachings and the wisdom of it, where I just finally felt that just incredible relief of, of, of a language and a formulation and uh, an understanding of something deeper, right? A, a, a kind of um, challenge to being right? A a difficulty in being, a difficulty in existence that isn't so easily measured in terms of like pleasant experiences or unpleasant experiences. And how incredibly, I mean, to, to have gone that far in my life, it isn't that I was just living all those years under this sort of cloud of existential, uh, misery or whatever the language might be but there was this persistent thing and and it's like i found my ways of course to understanding various things about suffering in the world and a lot of education a lot of you know experience in terms of my own life and and in particular like political philosophy and um, social justice philosophy right that could really help me understand the nature of of why of, of oppression on a social level uh, and and the systems of that and what creates that and what are the causes of that and what might be some ways of um, overcoming that. And so there was a, a, a sense of like the, where the pain in the world came from, how to fix that pain, but still not a sense of where the pain in me was coming from and how to fix that. So how, um, powerful it was to have the teachings, have the practice, and very early on to encounter Michelle, you know, who the, this, this sort of final part of, or maybe not final part, but very important other aspect of, of someone, right, who could, who I trusted to be able to really understand these things and then also understand my practice, my mind, my heart, what was the the way that this sort of method and these formulations might be more particularly attuned to my own conditions? Mm, and just what an incredible relief. But also it's a relief that comes through the the deepening, and I think in some ways purification of this acknowledgement of that quality of suffering that's sometimes so hard to describe. This sutta is called the Asu Sutta, tears. The Buddha's speaking to a group of monastics and says, from an inconstruable beginning comes rebirth. A beginning point is not evident. Though beings hindered by ignorance and fettered by craving are being reborn and wandering on. What do you think? Which is greater? The tears you have shed while being reborn and wandering this long, long time, crying and weeping from being joined with what is displeasing being separated from what is pleasing, or the water and the four great oceans. And they said, responded in unison, apparently, 
As we understand the Dhamma taught to us by the Blessed One, this is greater. The tears we have shed while being reborn and wandering this long, long time, crying and weeping from being joined with what is displeasing, being separated from what is pleasing, not the water in the great four, in the four great oceans. Excellent monks, excellent. It is excellent that you understand the Dhamma taught by me. This is greater. The tears you have shed while being reborn and wandering this long, long time, crying and weeping from being joined with what is displeasing, being separated from what is pleasing, not the water of the four great oceans. Long have you repeatedly experienced the death of a mother. The tears you have shed over the death of a mother while being reborn and wandering this long, long time, crying and weeping from being joined with what is displeasing, being separated from what is pleasing, are greater than the water in the four great oceans. Long have you repeatedly experienced the death of a father, the death of a brother, the death of a sister, the death of a son, the death of a daughter, loss with regard to relatives, loss with regard to wealth, loss with regard to disease. The tears you have shed over loss with regard to all of these things while being reborn and wandering this long, long time, crying and weeping from being joined with what is displeasing, being separated from what is pleasing, are greater than the water of the four great oceans. Why is that? From an inconstruable beginning comes rebirth. A beginning point is not evident, though beings hindered by ignorance, fettered by craving, are being reborn and wandering on. Long have you thus experienced stress, experienced pain, experienced loss, swelling the cemeteries, enough to become disenchanted with all fabricated things, enough to become dispassionate, enough to be released. This, whether we believe in the mechanics or kind of uh, dynamics of rebirth and lifetimes, the sense here of just acknowledging how weary we can be from all of this hardship, all of this loss, right? All of being joined with what is unpleasant and being separated from what is pleasant. And that there is something beyond even just in this lifetime that is um, compounded in our hearts, right? That has built up in our hearts. And where is this, uh, how bad does it have to get? How long do we have to be doing it? How weary do we have to be? before we become disenchanted, before we long for release and let go of these things, let go of the, all of the tendencies and patterns that, that recreate these cycles of existence, that recreate the suffering, that keep us hooked into these patterns of being and becoming, of, of creating more drama and trauma for ourselves and for others, more anguish, and where is that place of that deep longing in the heart for freedom, right? And in this context, to that depth of acknowledgement and hard to fathom of that freedom doesn't mean the eternal pleasant, right? But the, the release, the letting go, the quietude of that, the coolness of that, the relief of that in the heart. And where we think we're ready and where we're not ready and where we want to be ready. It's often it's often portrayed in these such very stark terms in the or clear terms in the suttas. You have um Darine and I have been reading some of the Jataka tales and there's a f there's one where the Buddha is talking about a past life when um he was born as a great king. He always was born as some great something or other, you know. And, um, he was at his barber, and he saw his barber found a single white hair in his in his head. 
and it struck him. So like there's dramatic, the magnitude of impermanence struck him like a lightning bolt. And he decided to renounce everything and to give up his whole kingdom and to go be a, a renunciate up in the mountains, you know. And he still had, this was, I think he was a deva or something. So he still had like 84,000 years left to live in his life. But he just, it was like, right, that clarity around like, I have to get out of this. <laughs> and so, uh, and, and powerful, even in that lifetime, he didn't pull it off, right? This was a previous lifetime. So he still, you know, he spent those 84,000 years like working on it. And many more of those types of many eon lifetimes. But the clarity of that, like, the shock and that soberness, you know, of like, this is what all this means. And not evading it, not avoiding it, and taking it to its natural, you know, joyous conclusion that, that the Buddha often, you know, would really expound upon. It's not a, it's not a depressing f feat to go become a renunciate. It's, it's joyous, you know. If you go to, you know, Myanmar, or, hang out with monks and nuns and you know that's that's always the question of like when are you going to ordain you know if you love this it's like this is your obviously this is come do this you know this is it there's beautiful joy in that so about three in the morning i decided I realized I had to wake up in two hours to do the morning walking, get myself awake for the morning walking practice. And maybe I should try to find my way to sleep. And um, this particular mind state that I was in, while it didn't feel like tense, it didn't feel anxious, it still was very energized, you know, um, if also calm. And I, um, I realized that I have a new resource in my life for these moments that I'm gonna share with you. Hey. Susan has a little guy there too. Cool. <laughs> um, I picked up this bear oh, over the holidays. I was um, visiting family and It wasn't easy. And part of the part of the difficulty was a uh, um, sort of pervasive kind of tension and kind of experience I had of kind of alienation. And, um, you know, I have all my tools and did all my work and practices and, um, felt, you know, pretty good about it. But towards the end, I, um, got out and he went into, went into town and came upon this bear in like a thrift store, you know, like a used store. And I just like immediately, I was like, I need, I need this bear. <laughs> And, uh, and I got it and it was just like, it was just so right away, this understanding of like, uh, like how these are such like, such powerful, almost like a, you know, like a lightning rod for gentleness and tenderness and um, compassion and softening of the heart. And so it was funny, I, you know, I bought it. And, and so I was in Cleveland when I got it. And it's not where I was staying. I was out of there. But we took spent a day and went around Cleveland a little bit. And the freezing, gray, <laughs> cold. And, um, and it's like walking around with a teddy bear is like a powerful thing. 
So it's like going into the grocery store, it's just like everyone would be like, oh, like people would just like light up and smile and soften and the sense of like, oh, like it was amazing. It was like, I don't know, it was, it, it was, it was better than having like a baby or something. You know what I mean? It was like this like really other thing kind of arises, you know? And then I went back to my grandfather's and you could just see it was like, oh, my aunt made a little ribbon. And there was like this sense of like, tenderness was just kind of brought in to the field and a softening that was just like such a lifesaver, such a relief, so beautiful and so powerful and, and so simple, you know? And um, there are times where I might buy something for a kid in my life or, you know, and um, it was very clear this was not for anyone else. <laughs> there was no, like, this is going to go to someone else or whatever, uh, you know, who knows, maybe someday. But I was like, I need this. And, um, and then, you know, bringing it here and getting, washing it and, um, you know, kind of like having it around and sort of just sort of seeing like, where does it fit in to my life? You know, like, not that I feel the, you know, a place for a teddy bear must be in the bedroom, you know, uh, but eventually it had, did make it in my bedroom <laughs> and it's like in a very appropriate place for it. And, um, the sense of like, having it um, and, and, and being an invitation into this softening has been really wonderful um, and feels very pure. And um, just wanted to check out the meditation things. I'm a little meditation, seems like it's going okay. Not super into the walking yet, like many yogis, but we'll see, you know, where that, where that goes. But part of the, you know, someone uh, mentioned yesterday, this phrase of like, get your, put your belly to the bar, which I was a phrase I didn't know. And, um, but when I heard, you know, you say it, Kathleen, I thought at first you said your belly to the bear. And so anyway, that's, that's my new uh, mantra for, for right now. <laughs> this sense of like, what, whatever we need to find some so, some place of tenderness, some place of softening. Um, why resist it, right? Why resist a sense of what's appropriate or what's whatever, you know, it's like, I, I just, I think so much about, um, you know, I was really happy in the last, you know, some years that there's like more, uh, some movies have come out about Mr. Rogers, you know, and just like how wonderful he was and how incredible this, you know, as a human, but also his, his show, you know, that he put on. I remember when that sort of first started, he was still alive and there was, a, there was a, some acknowledgement of him that was on television. And there was a woman there who talked about how um, as a little girl, she just grew up in a very, violent household where it just did not feel safe and it did, there she just did not feel like that sense of tenderness and connection and that she would come home from school and she would um, bring this she had a little tv in her room and she would bring it into the closet she would close the door she would turn the tv on and watch mr rogers and have her period of time of just like receiving his love, right? Receiving his care. And, and he was so good at always being like you, right? He was always talking to you uh, in terms of how he spoke um, on television and how it just like totally saved her life. Saved her life, but also gave her like these sense of these tools, right? Of, of at some point understanding that like we do have tools to find a connection to care Right. Sometimes it's we might learn it as something that's coming from externally, um, but that we, you know, we eventually start to see that there are ways that we can provide that for ourselves, or we don't, you know, or we don't learn that. Right. That like once we get to a certain age and we put away the teddy bear, and then there's just like, what, you know if we're lucky parents that are very loving and friends and community and all of that, but 
you know, for, for many of us, there's no deeper training in terms of how to find some place of care, some place of connection. You know, for this compassion practice, of course, you know, it's like children are such a wonderful, can be a wonderful place to practice in the mind. You know, this understanding of their sort of sensitivity and their worthiness can often be more um, easily accessible in terms of our own hearts, right? To care for, I, uh, Last year, at some point during this COVID period, uh, my um, sister-in-law asked me to record some, um, a few meditations for my little nephew, um, who at the time was I think like six or seven. So anyway, some point in the last couple of years. And um, it was really rich. It was very wonderful to do. Funny that it wasn't very different. You know, I mean, there were maybe like little things that I would change in terms of like the sense that they were in bed or it was bedtime or whatever, but um, felt really beautiful, you know, a really wonderful thing. And, and, um, and I, and, you know, apparently he and she and, you know, my brother all kind of appreciated it and, and it's something I want to do. I, I want to do more, um, more generally. You know, I, I thought about just using these same recordings, but unless there's a lot of other kids out there named Odin, I don't think it'll, something will like, be a little jarring in the beginning. So I do want to record more of, you know, just a few, just simple. Um, I was calling them the little bedtime Buddha uh, things and, and and that we have you know it's like the, there there are kids these days that are learning tools that most of us didn't have as children you know around their emotions and there's you know it's 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 wonderful and it's like that sense of like wow we, you know um or even you know i i started sitting with michelle in my 20s and joined a group of people that had young people that had been sort of sitting with her and Steve since they were teenagers. And I hadn't, you know, the, the thought of even having these as, as teenagers, you know, kind of how, just how wonderful, how powerful it would have been to have had that, you know, during times when it's, we can feel so alienated, challenges are, are so difficult. I'm not someone who, I, don't, I just don't romanticize childhood. I know a lot of people do the sense of like it was a the purity sort of of that time, but I know childhood is hard, you know, even if it's not hard, it's hard. And so, you know, as adults, um, wherever we are in our lives, it's like this, the both the power and the, the beauty and the amazing gratitude that we feel for having these teachings, having these practices, having people who can help us. And, you know, the, the monumental quality of the nature of the task, I think, is sometimes more and more evident. You know, the, the more powerful the mind gets in its softness and its tenderness, the more clear it gets. You know, sometimes it is the, the places where we're still stuck, the places where we, we still cause harm, um, internally or externally, you know, or the pain of those can be sometimes more visceral, more clear, you know. So we, as we develop the capacity, as we develop the tools, um, the places that are still undeveloped and underdeveloped can be, um, you know, that much more painful and take that much more courage to show up for, that much more humility to be honest about, you know, internally, externally. Mm, the the progress on this path is, is just not linear. And it's, it's mm, so much of it is not measurable in ways that are um, that meaningful, you know. So there's a, some sense of like a need of, you know, deepening faith 
whether we have it ourselves or sometimes we rely on others, you know, sometimes we, we borrow other people's faith when ours feels fragile, you know, not strong. I don't want to, I won't. It is important to recognize that in, in this tradition, there is a, there is a role for shame, right? There is a role for what's moral shame and moral dread here in Otapa, this, a place of acknowledgement of har of when we've harmed people or harmed ourselves and um, that were, or that we've acted unskillfully because of the influence of greed or the influence of aversion um, in particular. Delusion is a little less, and it, you know, for all of us, it's like, I mean, it's amazing how we might have remorse for so many little things in our lives, right? Like little things that maybe we did as children or young people or things that are just mostly embarrassing, not necessarily things that actually harmed anyone. But amazing to see the heart's kind of susceptibility and vulnerability to, to that version of shame around embarrassment or you know, wishing, wishing something was different in those ways. And you have to be very careful to not kind of get drowned in those things. Um, and the same with remorse around actions, you know, that maybe in that moment, we just weren't capable of seeing clearly and, and were cruel, you know, or harmful in one way or another. But that, 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 acknowledgement of of moral weight and the acknowledgement of our ability to change is so fundamental right it's in terms of apology and 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 acting differently as a as a powerful motivator and it's a delicate ground but i think there's you know uh, in some of my other studies i i've really valued this uh little quote it's a it was an exchange between uh, Karl Marx and uh, someone else talking about Germany and the, the situation in Germany back then. That isn't it. Marx didn't talk about rebirth. Here we go. He's talking about shame. And he says, you look at me with a smile and ask, what is gained by that? No revolution is made out of shame. And I reply, shame is already a revolution of a kind. Shame is a kind of anger, which is turned inward. And if a whole nation really experienced a sense of shame, it would be like a lion crouching, ready to spring. The sense of it as a positive motivating force, right? As a revolutionary, the, to unleash this sort of internal, in our case, revolutionary potential, right? Of like fathoming the fragility of beings, fathoming the difficulty of existence, fathoming how hard it is to see through that we are all susceptible, you know, until we're totally liberated, that we're all susceptible to delusion, to not seeing things clearly, susceptible to preference and uh, greed out of our preference and hurting people out of our preference or hurting people out of our ill will and anger and aversion. It takes a great deal of humility and acknowledgement of that. Because we've all borne the ill will and the pain of others, but we see how hard it is to not have this sort of combust right? Have not other people's ill will combust in our hearts to create more 
right? To create more potent, violent, destructive energy in the world. And that it has to, the, it's the mechanics of the combustion that we have to understand in order for it to stop. We can't just will it to stop. It's not simply a matter of discipline, right? You see this, the ethical conduct and the precepts, and yes, these are disciplines we take. They are commitments, they are determinations towards our own well being, towards the well being of others. But there is. Um, the other side of it, which is that we can't stop these things from happening just because we don't want them to internally. We can't stop greed from happening or anger just because we don't want it to. But we have the tools to understand, wow, how does this sense door experience, hearing this, seeing this, smelling this, tasting this, thinking this, conceiving of this, lead to this, lead to this, lead to this. What leads to what? What is the way that mindfulness, that these beautiful qualities of practice that we bring to bear on the present moment can start to change and transform and soften through understanding, right? The mechanics of all of the forces that create renewed existence and renewed suffering, renewed harm internally and externally. How much patience, how much strength, how much determination, right? This, this sense of the lion crouching, you know, that it's very Buddhist in its terminology, you know, the, the sort of vigor and the energy and everything that um, is required in order to be able to pursue this path, you know, almost unfathomable. but that we have to go into the fire of it, right? We have to go into the fire in order to liberate us, in, in order to extinguish the fire. And that is the translation of the word Nibbana, is extinguishment, right? The internal extinguishment of these fires, of hatred, of attachment, right? Of whatever it might be, of ignorance. Because all is burning. And what is the all that is burning? The eye is burning. Forms are burning. Eye consciousness is burning. Eye contact is burning. Also, whatever is felt as pleasant or painful or neither pleasant nor painful that arises with eye contact for its indispensable condition, that too is burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of lust. Burning with the fire of hate with the fire of delusion. I say it is burning with birth, aging and death, with sorrows and lamentations, with pains and griefs and despairs. The ear is burning, sounds are burning, the nose is burning, odors are burning, the tongue is burning, flavors are burning, the body is burning, tangibles are burning, tangible objects. The mind is burning, ideas are burning, mind consciousness is burning, mind contact is burning, Whatever is felt as pleasant or painful or neither painful nor pleasant that arises with mind contact for its indispensable condition, that too is burning. Burning with what? Burning with the fire of lust, burning with the fire of hate, with the fire of delusion. I say it is burning with birth, aging and death, with sorrows and lamentations and pains, with griefs, with despairs. Because when a noble follower who has heard the truth thus finds disenchantment in the eye, finds disenchantment in forms, finds disenchantment in eye consciousness, finds disenchantment in eye contact, and whatever is felt as pleasant or painful, or neither pleasant nor unpleasant, uh, that arises with eye contact for its indispensable condition, in that too, they find disenchantment. They find disenchantment in the ear, in the nose, in the tongue, in the body, in the mind. When they find disenchantment, passion fades. With the fading of passion, they are liberated. When liberated, there is a knowledge that they are liberated. They understand birth is exhausted. 
the holy life has been lived out. What can be done, done is what had to be done. There is no more going beyond this. This is what the Blessed One said, and the bhikkhus were glad and approved of his words. I was thinking recently, um, and as it is, it's uh, Martin Luther King Jr.'s birthday celebration, just about some of these great examples of nonviolent direct action and people willing to sit in the fire rather than create more harm, right? To be in this burning the eye, the ear, nose, body, tongue, mind, and of the consciousness from those things and the contact of those things and all that arises from those things, to be able to sit with it and bear it rather than unleash it upon others, rather than contribute to it, rather than create more burning, right? The burning down of the world. This famous monk, Thich Quang Do, which I'm sure I'm not saying right, that Vietnamese monk who very famously, you know, um, burned himself alive in Vietnam in 1963. In response, in uh, plea, in recognition of, you know, some terrible inhumanities that were happening, you know, and being created by his government at that point. And the power that that had around the world, power that continues to have, of course, there are, you know, many monks and nuns who have done this in the last decade or so. And uh, Tibetan regions and not getting as much, you know, media publicity about it, but it's, it's very, oh, you know, it's horrible, of course, on so many levels and, and so powerful. And one of the powerful, one of the amazing things that I didn't know until I read recently was that they said that in all of the ashes from his body, only his heart was left unburnt. And that it's, um, it's honored as a relic still. And so, you know, that, that, that action is so extreme. It's such an extreme version of, of something that actually we are all doing and that we're all called to do and that it is the sort of essence of these teachings, which is sitting in this fire Right? Maybe it is a metaphorical fire, but in the burning, right? the burning of all of these senses, the burning of uh, the passions that arise from those, this willingness to bear that hardship, the strength it takes, the strength of compassion, of tenderness, of how much, how much compassion it takes to be willing to feel this anger or feel the wanting or the anguish of the heart and not unleash it on others because we don't want to harm, right? And not unleash it on ourselves, internally, physically, emotionally, whatever way, because we don't want to harm ourselves just as much as we don't want to harm any other being, right? This profound lack of preference that is, comes out of the awareness of non-self, not prioritizing any being over another, including ourselves, but not at the expense of ourselves. Having been 
home for a few years now. I've had traveled some this year, but so much more grounded than than I had been in the past, you know, 10 years in terms of our normal travel. Um, you know, much more time to get a sense of the stars, the cycles of the seasons. Nothing compared to people who, of course, used to live in places for their entire lives and their communities and cultures for eons, right, in places. But even now to see, it's like, wow, it, it really took me a year of being here before I, just this past year, start to feel a little more sense of like the, the rhythm, you know, of the sun, of the moon, of the stars, of, of what to see. It's like, oh, this, this star is arising again now. It's January and this one is gone. And you know how beautiful that is from a distance. But of course, you go towards these stars and it's a totally different story, you know? They are unimaginable, like inconceivable, giant spheres of just combustion, right? Of like nuclear fusion, fission, just like raging, roaring balls of gas and flame bigger than anything we can conceive of with a kind of a fire beyond imagination, right? Beyond comprehension. We see the sun rise and we see it set and it's the cause of all life along with other things. <laughs> but without the sun, you know, none of this would be here. You know, none of none of what we think of as existence, life. And how beautiful but complicated that is then, right? This relationship that there's something in that that's true about existence right that that there is a fire at the heart of existence there is this combustion this burning this tempest of fire rooted in craving rooted in lust rooted in wanting and ignorance right and not understanding and it creates everything, the things that we love, the things that we hate, the things we wish there was more of, the things we wish there was less of. But there's none of it without that. And so of course, our relationship to this renunciation, our relationship to the, the wanting of the relief and wanting of the peace is going to be mixed. We want the peace, we, of course we want the relief. We want that fire extinguished. The relief of that coolness of Nibbana. The no arising, the no passing, you know, that's in that chant that we chant when it says, uh, you know, liberation from birth and death. That's what it means. That's what it's referring to. And yet, of course, we're attached to it. Of course, we're ambivalent about being liberated from all of it. And so we have our attachments and they hurt. We have our wanting to be free because existence hurts. And we have these practices, right? We have these tools. We have these reminders of like how much care we need, you know, how much tenderness, how crazy it is, <laughs> how like totally overwhelming it is. And to get a taste of freedom for ourselves or in others, it's so important. You know, there's this monk who we've talked about at times, the, called him the happy Saira, Myatang Saira. Very, very free. And now even still, it was like this when you were with him and now at his tomb in the Sagang Hills, 
you go to his tomb and there's just this feeling of like the opposite of all that nuclear reaction. Oh, the opposite of that giant mass of fire. The opposite of this sort of, yeah, like nuclear reactor. It's just this profound coolness, and emptiness and peace and the relief of that. How beautiful it is to aspire to that. And how beautiful it is to care about the combustion, the coming and going. Just about a month ago, I think, you know, so the, Venus has been visible for so long. I don't even remember when it started to be visible out in the western sky at night around sunset, and it just got really high for a long time. It was so bright, and then went back down, and then maybe just about a month ago, it it stopped coming up over the horizon at um, sunset. And it's like, okay, yeah, all these other stars are coming. The, you know, other planets are still there. And, but it is something poignant, you know, something like a sense of loss and that just incredible beauty. So it's such, such a beautiful, bright, glowing object. And then this morning when we were doing our walking meditation out, um, you know, walking back and forth in compassion, I um, just at the end looked up and to the east as the sun was coming up and there was Venus, you know, now in its cycle of being the morning star. And it was like, I've never had the experience. This is the first time I've ever felt this, what to me, what feels like if, if you, if someone died and then you felt like you met them again as a child, right? Where you're, if you really recognize some child as someone you had known, that's what it felt like. The sense of like, oh, you're back again, you know, and, and how wonderful and how beautiful and, and how weary, perhaps. But how enlivening and how warming of the heart, you know, that felt. Let's just sit for a moment. So thank you for your presence and kind attention. For those of you who are signing off, have a good evening. For those of you who are finishing up the retreat this weekend, we'll see you in an hour for the uh, metta chanting and sit. Yeah. Take care.